December 1978, a Melbourne, Australia television news crew filmed an object they claimed was a UFO. That film gave chilling credibility to an earlier report of an Australian pilot who disappeared after he radioed that he was being strafed by a UFO. Stop, Sierra Juliet. Affirmative. It's not an aircraft. Are there UFOs in the skies over Australia and New Zealand? In the last 30 years, there have been more than 110,000 recorded UFO sightings. Researchers estimate that that number reflects only a tenth of those actually seen. Eyewitnesses claim that in nearly all cases, the UFOs have a saucer-like shape. Despite repeated official government denials that UFOs exist, some people point to hard evidence of scorched areas on the Earth's surface where UFOs have supposedly landed. Believers claim that the scarred areas are caused by intense heat generated by the UFOs. UFO sightings occur throughout the world, but the great majority of reports have been in the southern hemisphere, in the skies over New Zealand and Australia. It was here that the most astounding UFO footage in history was recorded. On December 21st, 1978, Radar bowls near Wellington, New Zealand picked up what air traffic controllers called an unexplained blip. A local pilot, Vern Powell, was at the same time bound on a cargo mission from the South Island to the North Island of New Zealand. Powell described the object as anything but plane-like in nature. What was it that Captain Powell, a 35-year flying veteran, saw in that December night sky? Douglas Mabin heads New Zealand's Mount John Observatory. Well, at that time uh, that was taken, there were two very bright objects in the sky. One early in the morning was the planet Venus, seen in the mornings fairly close to the horizon. And during the night, from a little bit before midnight through to morning, the planet Jupiter was up in the sky, and it was very bright, though not as bright as Venus. So depending on the time of day or night when the photographic was taken, it could have been one of those two planets. People have been able to give us um, a fair enough uh, description of the time and the position in the sky. They see these things, we're able to work it out. And every report I've had, we've had the, that sort of description, we've been able to identify it. The reports of these have been going on for so many years now, and if there's such an intelligent uh, set of people about out, coming from outside the Earth that have been coming around all these times, I think by now they would have landed and introduced themselves. Others weren't so sure. Quentin Fogarty, a reporter for an Australian television station, was in New Zealand at the time of Vern Powell's flight. The station requested him to do a story on Powell's experiences. Together with David Crockett, a New Zealand cameraman, Fogarty decided to retrace the flight path of Captain Powell. In Search Of has recreated what happened to Fogarty on that fateful flight. Fogarty planned to make the 400 mile round trip between Wellington and Christchurch in a massive Argosy aircraft, which was already scheduled for a freight run. Armed with cameras and sound equipment, the two men hoped to film proof of what Powell had reported. Fogarty realized that the chances of seeing what Powell saw 10 days earlier were remote, but he still had strange feelings about the flight. There were stages there where I was very, very frightened. I mean, I thought, well, if I was to die, or if in fact I was to be removed from that aircraft in some shape or form, then it wasn't going to be a painful process, and 
You can't, I can't really explain why I felt that. It's just a feeling I had. The flight was long. Captain Bill Startup rarely scanned the night sky. Fogarty and cameraman Crockett waited in the hold. Testing, one, two, three. Just checking the intercom. Suddenly, Captain Startup spotted the object and called to Fogarty. Quick, off to starboard. The object seemed to be hovering around the aircraft. Do you see it? Unable to get good camera position, Fogarty and Crockett raced up to the cockpit. This is the film they shot. And by the time David and myself got onto the flight deck, I could see two bright lights. And in retrospect, it now appears that this object was quite low and, in fact, was reflecting on the water. We just kept looking at this one bright object that looked uh, like a very bright star outside our starboard window. So we turned towards the object, and at this time, David was continuing to film. And at one stage, he said to me, he got very excited and turned around to me and said, you know, it's got a brightly lit bottom and a sort of transparent sphere on top. And I was doing a tape commentary at the time and I remember saying that that sounded like a classic flying saucer shape. And I think it was the last person to see it was that I looked out the right-hand side of the aircraft and looked, peered right down. And this object just went below the aircraft and disappeared. Um, nobody connected with this case has been prepared to say that uh, they are extraterrestrial because I don't think you can ever say anything is extraterrestrial until you can actually physically hold on to it or meet with the inhabitants or you know all the thing lands in Central Park and you've been with live television around the world and then people would say it was hoaxed anyway um, but there are a number of possibilities and I think that probably the strongest of all the possibilities is that it is extraterrestrial the film is unlike any other recorded in history the object darted about changed color shimmered with an eerie translucency. The object was incredibly bright, far brighter than any planet or star. The film, shot by Fogarty and Crockett, has since been analyzed by U.S. and Australian scientists. Their conclusions have been that it does show some metallic object, unearthly in its brightness. No one will hazard a guess as to what it was or why it appeared where it did. By plotting where UFOs have reportedly appeared, a complicated grid system was devised by a man who has become the dean of UFO researchers. Bruce Cathy, a commercial pilot for more than 40 years, believes that his system, controlled by the elements of light, energy, and matter, validates the presence of UFOs. Uh, I only found the system by actually studying UFOs, or the movement of UFOs. And um, it was after I uh, found out UFOs have to use that system, or tuned into that system if they're going to move from point to point in space. The, the UFO shots were taken in New Zealand around last Christmas. Everything points to the fact that they were definitely, it was hardware in the sky. And the main reason I say this is the fact that it's not the first time. It was a bit of a joke to us at the time when there was such a furor made about this publicly worldwide as if it was one case, well, it's not, it's not so. There's been many, many cases similar to this in New Zealand and in the same area. There's been material tracked around the Cook Strait area and up around that area on many occasions by radar in Wellington and on many occasions, even in daylight, there's been an object seen in the sky by a uh, cruise in an aircraft and there's also been uh, sight on radar and in one of those particular cases the radar crew asked the crew of the aircraft to vector themselves onto this object so that they could get a closer look at it. The crew were watching this from a distance and they, they refused and uh, that object was in that area for so long that even on the second trip back from Wellington across the Straits again it was still there. The crew saw it a second time but uh, that was a broad daylight case. So in no way could they say there was lights at night being reflected or a Venus or anything like this. This is, um, but as I say, there have been many cases like this.
and um, particularly in that area. This UFO film shot over New Zealand might bear a strange relationship to an event which occurred three months earlier. In Search Of examines that event next. October 21st, 1978. 20-year-old Frederick Valentik took off to fly 120 miles from Melbourne, Australia, across the Bass Strait to King Island. Valentik was scheduled to pick up some fish for a small market that employed him. Despite his youth, he was experienced enough to be a flight instructor, and Frederick Valentik had flown this route many times before. Delta Sierra Juliet, pilot to ground. Is there any known aircraft in my vicinity below 5,000 feet? Delta Sierra Juliet, negative, no known traffic. Delta Sierra Juliet, there seems to be a large aircraft below 5,000 feet. Delta Sierra Juliet, what type of aircraft? I cannot confirm, but it's four bright lights that appear to be landing lights. Unknown aircraft that just passed over me, about 1,000 feet. Is large aircraft confirmed? Delta Sierra Juliet, affirmative at the speed it's travelling. Are there any RAAF aircraft in the vicinity? Negative. Confirm you can't identify aircraft. Affirmative. Delta Sierra Juliet, Melbourne, it's approaching from due east of me. It seems to be playing some sort of game flying at a speed I can't estimate. Stephen Roby, air traffic controller on duty then, explains the reported UFO's uh, movement. ...times, and uh, coming from various directions. And then he started orbiting, and uh, the aircraft was orbiting above him. And on several occasions, he sort of stated that it, towards the end it wasn't an aircraft and he described it as having a, a sort of a, a green light uh, on it and also it appeared to be um, a sort of a silver metallic colour. Delta Sierra Juliet. What is your altitude? Delta Sierra Juliet, 4,500 feet. Delta Sierra Juliet, confirm you can't identify aircraft. Affirmative. It's not an aircraft, it's... Guido Valentik is Frederick's father. Night. Uh, he's supposed to join us with friends when we went for some movie, uh, family movie projection. And uh, that night, uh, he never turned up. He didn't ring up. Normally, he's always, when he goes for a trip, uh, when he returned at the airport, he normally would have called us, you know, I'll be home after an hour or so. But that night, uh, it was quite strange, you know. We didn't know anything about it. We got home about 11 o'clock and he wasn't home. My wife then started to worry about it. And, and so, uh, you know, I oh, said, oh, this is too late to start inquiry. Can you describe it? Delta Sierra Juliet. It's flying past. It is a long shape. Cannot identify more than that. Coming for me right now. And you describe it as being of a, a long shape, and as I said before, it's a silver colour with the various lights on it. And uh, he actually did say it wasn't an aircraft. So it's very strange. It appears to be stationary. I'm orbiting. The thing, it's orbiting on top of me. It has a green light and a sort of metallic light on the outside. It seems to have vanished now. Confirm it has vanished. Affirmative. Do you know what sort of aircraft I've got? Is it military? No military traffic in this area. It was 8 o'clock, 8.30 in the morning. I, I Nothing still happening and couldn't see any sign of him and uh, I was just about to get up and maybe get on the phone where all of a sudden a couple of 
uniform blue slack <laughs> legged walk in the front door. And at that time, we realized immediately that something was wrong. Delta Sierra Juliet, engine is rough idling and coughing. Delta Sierra Juliet, what are your intentions? Proceeding King Island. Delta Sierra Juliet, unknown aircraft now hovering on top of me. Finally, um, we lost contact with him in a very strange way. Uh, the communications he was putting out seemed to break. Um, people describe it as a sort of a metallic sound, the last transmission that was uh, sent from Delta Sierra Juliet. Delta Sierra Juliet, acknowledge. Do you read me? Delta Sierra Juliet, repeat, do you read me? Despite an extensive four-day search, which included using a sophisticated Orion aircraft capable of detecting any sort of debris at great ocean depths, not a single scrap of wreckage was ever found. No hard evidence ever turned up that would explain the disappearance of Frederick Valentik. But theories abound. Some say that Valentik became disoriented and saw this lighthouse. A second theory is that he saw lights of fishing vessels and then, becoming disoriented, spiraled his plane into the ocean. Guido Valentik, Frederick's father, believes otherwise. Well, after Frederick reported this uh UFO incident, I uh, inclined to think uh, that it could be some intelligent life in the other space, uh, despite all the officials are trying to suppress this, or well, really uh, makes me very confused, because knowing Frederick would be radiated, and uh, knowing my son wouldn't make himself so ridiculous in stating things like that so i'm inclined to believe that really must be something in the space that the general population may not aware to be and i realized after this, his disappearance which i couldn't have the opportunity before how many calls i get from various parts of the world and they really encourage me to believe that he could be still alive I bit with another intelligence in the spice. One of the most bizarre attempts to prove Valentic still lives is conducted by New Zealand psychic Colin Amory. He claims that through the power of a seance, he can contact Valentic and speak in his voice. Death is something that is quite painless and is not difficult to bear. Valentic's plane and the supposed UFO were beyond the reach of radar, thus making it impossible to confirm his report and the taped conversation between Valentik and the air traffic controller has never been released. The Australian Civil Aviation Department has refused all requests to hear that tape. The department will not give any reason for its refusal. There have been hundreds of planes that have disappeared without a trace. 
Valendik's disappearance is the single documented case where a plane has vanished after claiming contact with a UFO. For years, in search of cameras have found and recorded the reports of individuals claiming to have seen UFOs. And there was this weird object, funny noises, and it was really bright. When I first saw it, I was standing approximately right here. But I couldn't get too good of a view of it because the brush and the trees are in the way. I, I don't know how many people saw it and told us the next day that they saw this thing up in the sky. In the sky. I noticed up by the blue shed over there that there was uh, something in the sky. It was definitely right there. On the night of November 2nd, 1975, I was sitting here doing my homework, and I looked out the window, and right above the blue building, I saw a UFO come down out of the sky. All of these first-hand accounts, together with the strange occurrences in the Southern Hemisphere, only makes one wonder what really does exist in outer space. <laughs>